summary of Jeremiah, some history, some jelly donuts, and a social experiment today on another episode of the Bible in one year with the preacher's husband. Today we're going through 2 Kings chapter 24 and 25 and also 2 Chronicles chapter 36. Now tomorrow, if you're reading is Habakkuk 1 through 3, so you can get a head start on that. So let's jump into it and get into our summaries here. 2 Kings chapter 24 starts out with Jehoiakim's rebellion and his death. Now, the background for verse 1 here um, was that the Babylonian capture of Carchemish was in 605 BC. Now, that drove Egypt from Syria and Palestine. The object of the Babylonian attack was the Egyptian armies, and Jeho uh, Jehoiakim yielded peaceably to Nebuchadnezzar. Then after three years, jo Jehoiakim rebelled because Egypt temporarily drove the Babylonians northward again. So that gave him a little confidence. That happened in about 601 BC. The Babylonians, as God's instruments, they compensated for the setback by encouraging the other local vassals mentioned here to harass Judah. So they started teaming up with Babylon again. Um, verses 3 and 4 here, as in the condemnation of Judah at the time of Manasseh that we read about in chapter 21 of 2 Kings, the writer here of 2 Kings took a, a longer, kind of a backward looking view in accounting for God's judgment on sin. He actually linked God's judgment here and intent to remove the Hebrews from his presence to the sins of Manasseh. Now the sin of the times was the continuation of a sinful national character that had already been established and judged. Now, the Babylonians, they counterattacked, and they were soon approaching Jerusalem's um, Jehoiakim died, either just before or during the, that Babylonian siege there. Um, his rebellion was discredited. The absence of any formal statement about Jehoiakim's burial here could confirm Jeremiah's prediction about the shameful circumstances of his death when we read about that in Jeremiah chapter 22. Now, you get to verses 8 and 9. This was Jehoiachin, or Kin, Jehoiachin, not Kim, but Kin, was 18 years old when he became king, and he reigned for three months in Jerusalem. We heard about that one. He was the throne name, that was the throne, his throne name, Jehoiachin, but um, his real name is Jeconia, or Jeconiah, however you want to pronounce that. We learned that in First Chronicles 3 and Jeremiah 24. But when you read about it in Jeremiah, they shorten his name at, at times to Coniah. Remember Coniah that we talked about in Jeremiah 22? That's the same guy that we're talking about here. Um... He did what was evil in the Lord's sight, just as his father did. Only made it about three months. That's it. So we get to verses 10 through 12-ish. And after a brief siege, Jehoiakim and all his high officials surrendered to Nebuchadnezzar of Babylon. That's his three-month reign. Significantly, the expression eighth year of his reign actually refers to Nebuchadnezzar's eighth year, not his. So this changed to a pagan dating system or dating of events marked the impending end of Judah at this point and that was in the year 597 BC that we would we would call it the plundering of the city of Jerusalem it seemed to be pretty thorough it was kind of remarkable to me though that um there was still some gold left from the time of Solomon as it said here even left to be plundered after more than three centuries of foreigners coming in and plundering this place over and over. I was just shocked that there was still anything left from Solomon at all. But um, this fulfilled the prophecy to Hezekiah in chapter 20 of 2 Kings, verse 17. And then everyone except for the very poorest class of the city were taken into captivity. I guess they didn't feel that the poor folks would be very useful. I don't know how that is. Um... The formal opening statements and evaluation of Zedekiah are pretty routine for a wicked and faithless king here that we read about. 
and verse 20 the grounds for zedekiah's poor evaluation predated the wickedness of the current king god was already angry and judgment was already inevitable when zedekiah came into power so we're going to move on to chapter 25 and of course that verse on your screen sticks out a lot so there is a background here of pharaoh and how everything came to pass with pharaoh but this is a very short summary of the things that happened and you don't get a lot of detail in here but um ribla was the administrative center for babylonian control in the region there so zedekiah was being punished his sons were killed right before his eyes thus eliminating the threat of heirs to the throne and zedekiah of course was blinded and taken to prison in babylon now there was a reason for that as well that actually fulfilled another prophecy that he would see see nebuchadnezzar but he would not see Babylon. He was taken to Babylon, but he did not see it because they blinded him. And that's going to be in Ezekiel chapter 12, verses 11 through 13, that we're going to read about 10 days from now. So we're going to move on. And we get this guy, Gedaliah, that was made the governor. We talked about him in Jeremiah. And Jehoiakim was pardoned at the end of this. So then we're going to move on to 2 Chronicles 36. And this is Judah's king Jehoahaz. Um, Judah's king Jehoah, Jehoiakim, as in Kim, and king Judah's king Jehoiakim, Judah's king Zedekiah, and the destruction of, Ju of Jerusalem. Now, Verse 21, this fulfilled the word of the Lord through Jeremiah, and the land enjoyed its Sabbath rest all the days of the desolation until the 70 years were fulfilled. So, the destruction of Jerusalem happened, but and the prophecy was fulfilled, but that's not the end of the story yet. The decree of Cyrus. See, this story wasn't quite over. The Babylonians were eventually conquered by King Cyrus of Persia. Go figure that one out. Now, Cyrus decreed that all the foreign gods in Babylon and Persia should be transported back to their places of origin and that the people who worship them should return and build new temples for these deities. The Jews correctly saw Cyrus as God's instrument in issuing this command. The decree to release the Jews was made in 539 BC. So you see... God can use people, even though you may disagree with them, they may even be your enemies, God can still use even your enemies for His glory and for His works and His purposes. We're going to read about that more in Ezra chapter 1 in about 8 days from now. Now, 15 and 16 stuck out to me. I'm going to read these. I'm going to read them from the version here and let you read along on the screen, but it's going to be a different version a little bit. It says, But the Lord, the God of their ancestors, sent word against them, by the hand of his messengers. God sent word by the hand of his messengers. Sending them time and time again. For he had compassion on his people. And on his dwelling place. So he sent messengers over and over and over again. To tell these people what's going to happen. And how to avoid it. And what to do right. And what to do right, what's going to be wrong. And it says here in verse 16. But they kept on. They kept ridiculing God's messengers despising his words and scoffing at his prophets until the Lord's wrath was so stirred up against his people that there was no remedy. They were pretty much destined to be destroyed at that point. And I keep thinking about that and I think about today, this day and age, I think about what America's going through now. And I did kind of a social experiment, so to speak, today. And during that social experiment, I posted a post on Facebook. And I knew exactly at least one person that was going to comment on this and take it completely out of context and spin it off to the left in some liberal rant. And they did. And actually, there were three. And two of these didn't surprise me at all. One kind of did surprise me. But the one thing that I know about, there was also someone that was conservative that kind of took the wrong approach said, whoa, 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 wait a minute. You know, all the way I understand it is this way, and this is not really what it is. Well, the point of the post wasn't even politics. 
It simply stated that I have seen where the press has said and done an article about, and I put the topic up here about Joe Biden and doing a wanting Congress to pass this stimulus bill of $1,400. And then as I went through and I talked about how both the left and the right does certain things and they do this for their own personal benefits. And the point of this was, and then we get to the end of the post, it says the only way to bring people together essentially is that they have to find a common interest really. And those last two lines were basically saying that we need to focus on Jesus and we need to get our booties back into church and start using our Bibles, right? Well, of course, they took this on complete political spins in both sides, and need, none of these even mentioned those last two lines about what we need to do to fix this. They just started pronouncing their their sides of the story, their liberal views, and then these conservative views, and how both sides attacked me. I got a attack from both sides. So my goal, I guess, was accomplished by ticking off everybody. But the point wasn't to tick everybody off. It was to let them understand and let them to see that this is not the way to unity. There is not a political figure that is going to be bring complete unity to our country without God. That's the only way. And you say, well, are there any political figures that you do like, John? Yeah, I like George Washington. Everybody says, oh, you like George Washington. Yeah. Well, I also liked Abraham Lincoln. And, of course, the ones on the, the right are going to say, yeah, yeah, well, we love him, too. And, then, well, I like Ronald Reagan. He was a great guy. He was one that brought people together. Well, how did he do it? He constantly talked about God. Well, who was another person that brought people together? You're like, John, these are all Republicans. Well, I kind of like JFK, you know. I really like John F. Kennedy, and there was a reason for that. How do you not like a guy that stands up in front of thousands and thousands of people and says, I am a jelly donut. And they just go wild. And they just love him for it. And it just is amazing. Just cause a jelly donut. We love him. That's not really what happened. Okay. He did go to Berlin and he gave this, this speech. And his Ich bin ein Berliner, which directly translated does mean I am a Berliner. And of course a Berliner is a type of jelly donut. But he was referring to being a citizen of Berlin or a, a Berlin a person from Berlin, not a jelly donut. It's kind of an urban legend that developed, but didn't develop till later. And But the reason why I really like him is not necessarily because of his political standpoints, his political views, but how he spoke about God, how he spoke about unity at times. And that Ich bin ein Berliner speech itself was probably one of the best anti-communism speeches ever given in my opinion from a historical standpoint um all politics aside well you can't put politics aside when you're talking about political structures but i just think communism is bad today's democrats are clearly not on that side now but to my point the next person i'm going to talk about here is a political figure this person is a democrat this person i'm going to talk about was actually a member of the kkk this person was a racist. This person voted against the 1964 Civil Rights Act. In fact, this guy decided to participate in filibustering it because he was so against giving people their civil rights, giving blacks their civil rights. And he was a Democrat, and it was Robert Byrd, a Democratic senator. He actually spent the longest amount of time as a sitting senator in U.S. history, he still holds that. And it was over 57 years. It was like 57 years in one month. Now, there was one House representative in Congress that made it 59 years, but he's the longest sitting senator in U.S. history. And even being all these things that I mentioned before, how bad he is, there's one thing that I absolutely love about this man, and that is this right here in 1962. Here's what happened. Democrat Senator Robert Byrd, in, he delivered a message in June the 27th of 1962, just two days after the Supreme Court declared that prayer in schools was unconstitutional. He was warning Congress about this disastrous decision 
and decisions like it that have happened in the past and will probably continue to happen in the future. And he was right. They have continued to happen in the future. And these, this is referring to 2 Chronicles chapter 36, verse 15. Think about this. And the Lord God of their fathers sent warnings to them by his messengers. See, God has sent messengers from both political parties in America, all the political parties in the entire world, God has sent messengers to every country, not just ours, not just Judah, not just Jerusalem itself, that city, but but all over the world, God has sent his messengers. And this is evidence of that. Here's his words about that Supreme Court decision. He says this, "...in as much as our greatest leaders have shown no doubt about God's proper place in the American birthright, can we in our day dare do less? In no other place in the United States are there so many and such varied official evidences of deep and abiding faith in God on the part of government as there are in Washington. Every session of the House and the Senate begins with prayer. Each House has its own chaplain. The 83rd Congress set aside a small room in the Capitol just off the rotunda for the private prayer and meditation of members of Congress. The room's focal point is a stained glass window showing George Washington kneeling in prayer. Behind him is etched these words from Psalm 16, verse 1. Preserve me, O God, for in thee do I put my trust. Inside the rotunda is a picture of the pilgrims. Very clear are the words, the New Testament according to our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. On the sale of the motto of the pilgrims, In God we trust, God with us. The phrase, In God we trust, appears opposite the President of the Senate, who is the Vice President of the United States. The same phrase, in large words inscribed in the marble, backdrops the Speaker of the House of Representatives. Above the head of the Chief Justice of the Supreme Court are the Ten Commandments, with the great American eagle protecting them. Moses is included among the great lawgivers in Herman A. McNeil's marble sculpture group on the East Front. The crier who opens each session closes with the words, God save the United States and this honorable court. On the south banks of Washington's tidal basin, Thomas Jefferson still speaks, and he quoted Thomas Jefferson's words here. This is the words of Thomas Jefferson. God who gave us life gave us liberty. Can the liberties of a nation be secure when we have removed the conviction that these liberties are the gift of God? Indeed, I tremble for my country when I reflect that God is just, that his justice cannot sleep forever. And then Robert Byrne goes on to say that Jefferson's words are a very forceful and explicit warning that to remove God from this country will destroy it. Now, for everyone that thinks that they're right and the other side's wrong, liberals are right and conservatives are wrong. Conservatives are right and liberals are wrong. Well, guess what? You're both wrong. But y'all can find common ground. And that common ground is in God. And if we don't have that common ground in God, that's when our country falls. And the fall of our country started in about 1946, 47, when these things started happening. And then we saw it again right here tonight in this one. And we're gonna, we've are gonna we continued to see it over and over and over again. So how are we going to stop it? Get back to praying. Get back to God. And... As far as that, this was the purpose of my social experiment right here to prove that when I went back and told people what the point of this was, every single one of them was like, oh, okay, I thought this was a stab at me. Oh, okay, I thought this was a stab at me on the right. Oh, well, actually it wasn't. It was, and every, what really just bewildered me is almost every one of them that threw out those, those contradictions were leaders in their church. They're leaders in Christian communities their leaders throughout their own communities. And I, it bewilders me that those leaders who proclaim to be Christians 
can be so divisive of people and can divide so much. We talk about unity, but how are we going to unite? We're going to unite under one cause. So Christians, get out there, unite. Get out there and spread the good word of God. I hope this has touched you. If it has, click that like button, subscribe button. Click, click that share button if this has touched you tonight, if you like some of the history there. I didn't pick a political side. I still don't pick a political side. I'm kind of in the middle between the two at this point because I've seen how much destruction the extremes on both sides can do. And I implore you, look to God. Look to God. Um, click that little little boxing glove so you can rumble with me on Rumble and set your notifications so you can get notified the next time I upload a video, which will be tomorrow for another episode of the Bible in one year with the preacher's husband. I know this went long, but it is what it is. I'll see you tomorrow.